everyone. Hopefully people are in a mood where they're looking forward and kind of thinking about what the year is going to look like. I think we're going to bring you something today that is going to really help as people want to reflect and look at what they're doing with pricing and how they're bringing value to their clients. And so that's the main focus that we have for today. So today we're talking optimizing our pricing and delivery strategies to improve our client experience. So Geraldine Carter is going to be our main presenter today. I'm going to help her with that. So I met Geraldine at the North Carolina Association of CPAs, where she was the keynote speaker for the Converge conference. I found her very engaging and really focused on kind of what I hear a lot of CPAs talking about as she does consulting with CPAs. So I'm really excited that she'll be going through that. Um, Geraldine, you want to tell us a little bit of your story and kind of how you got here today? Yeah. So I also didn't quite get what was in the video. You watch yeah. it again. <laughs> okay, good. So uh, so my story is that I was an accidental biz business owner in my 30s and with a I co-founded a business and because I have an engineering background I fell into the operations and finance role and we had in after the fifth year a million dollar business and went through a couple of bookkeepers accountants and CPAs in order to try and find the right one and what my experience as a business owner was that I couldn't ever find the accountant that I was that I wanted. So I spent as a consequence, a lot of late nights in my own spreadsheets, trying to forecast revenue and can we afford to hire staff and what is, you know, what do our expenses look like? What do our, um, what's all that look like going forward? And I couldn't find anybody who could help me look into the future with the money. And after long story short, um, changed courses, went out on my own, started coaching and consulting and found my way into working with CPAs and was fascinated by this problem of why is it that smart people, smart accountants work weekends, especially when there's a lot of demand and why is it that they underprice and overwork to compensate? What is going on? So I'm just really curious. I got really curious about this problem and that led to working exclusively with CPAs, especially and specifically the ones who are solo CPAs in mid six figures working 60 hours a week. And how do we get them down to a 40 hour work week without losing revenue? So that's the shortest possible version of that yeah. story. I, I love that. And your personal experience working with them. So you've got both the client experience and working with them. Yeah. So a little bit about me, I do the role of virtual CFO and I've got 15 clients currently where I play the role of CFO for them, especially around forecasting, advising, helping them with their financial reporting needs. Work with Summit Virtual CFO by Anders in doing that. Um, I've done that for about six years now. So if we jump two slides forward, perfect. So we do have some housekeeping things. So today is a one credit course, we need everyone to attend all 50 minutes. We will have three poll questions. I probably won't announce those. will just pop up on your screen, but need people to answer all three of those. Um, having done so, we will send out the CPD, CPE certificates and replay slides. All that will come out after this. We didn't send anything out before. One of the most important things I'll mention is we really like questions during this, and I'm excited we've got 96 people here today. We should have lots of good questions. And so as people ask those, I'll be monitoring those, and wherever I can, I'll get them in so that we can get those answered during the program. So we really want this to be as interactive as it's possible to be. So as you have things, I've worked with Geraldine before and know that she is really good at answering things, kind of pivoting if we need to. And so if you have those kind of questions, please ask us those. Okay, so I mentioned that I work at Summit Virtual CFO by Anders, so let me tell you just a little bit about us. So we started Summit CPA Group a little bit more than 20 years ago as traditional accounting firm audits and tax kind of work. Starting in 2004, we started offering back office accounting and virtual CFO services. We really started doubling down on that to the point of 2013. That was really the main service offering that we have, and we went to be a distributed company. So we're completely remote with our clients and our team. As of last year or two years ago now, we joined some, uh, Andrews CPA and Advisors, a more traditional St. Louis-based accounting firm. And so we're excited to be part of them. And now we are, as I mentioned before, Summit Virtual CFO by Anders. Now a hybrid company because we do still have the remote option for what was the Summit team members and then Anders as in itself in a hybrid option. So that's a little bit about us. Value pricing delivery. Geraldine, tell us the big three problems that we're going to be working through today and how we're going to solve those. <laughs> All right, so we're handing it over. So 
in the so Tom and I were talking before we went live, and mm -hmm. I want to give you listeners this content in the context of what I think you are up to, which is either you own your own business already, or you're thinking about going out on your own and, or you're inside a firm and you want to start adding more virtual CFO and advisory type services. So I want to give you this content, knowing that that's either where you are or potentially where you're headed. And as a business owner, I recognize that you are an accountant, a CPA, but you are first and foremost, once a business owner, you are a business owner. And when you become a business owner, your job changes dramatically. And the, the sooner we can recognize that what we really need to be focused on is no longer simply doing the work and delivering the work. It is this bigger picture where the work and the delivery fits inside the bigger picture. The sooner we can recognize that, the easier your job will be as a business owner. And you might be wearing multiple hats, right? If you're a solo, or maybe you have a person underneath you, or maybe you have a staff of 10 or 40, chances are excellent. You are wearing a ton of hats. I've been there too. I'm still there as a business owner. Hold on. I got to answer the question before I can. <laughs> oh, wait, let me see. It should. Okay. Bed okay. There. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, good. So um, as a business owner, you're wearing a ton of hats. And the sooner you can wrap your head around what your real job is now as a business owner, the easier your business will become and the easier your life will become. The more you continue to focus on the delivery of services, the more you're going to be in the delivery and sort of sucked into the business of delivering the services. And I want to help you kind of rise up, gain altitude, and be able to see the the bigger picture. And that's what I want to talk with you about today is what like what is this bigger picture? And I think that really at the end of the day, you only have three problems in your business. And when we can simplify it down to the three main problems that you have in your business so that you can look at each one as a mutually exclusive problem and figure out how to solve one problem at a time and only one problem at a time and unravel this knot that is so often just feels like, oh my God, I'm working all the time. I'm overwhelmed. I'm slammed. I'm exhausted. I'm fried. Is this all worth it? What am I doing? What have I done to myself? All of a sudden, you know, I thought I was going to go out on my own, hang my shingle and life was going to be dreamy, but now I'm working 80 mm -hmm. hours a week. What is happening? So I want to help you understand what is happening if you're working extra hours and how to get out of that. So if we can Jody, simplify this problem, yeah, go ahead. This is so perfect because the question I put up was what are the barriers to implementing changes? And almost half the people said time to implement changes is one of the biggest yeah. barriers. So I love that you're addressing time because I, I think you're already seeing from our audience that they're already saying, yep, this is one of my biggest issues. Excellent. Yeah. Time is, um, time is such a challenge and I will talk about it as the third problem. Um, delivering efficiently, but also that time doesn't get, how, like, how do we get more time so that you can implement these changes? Mm -hmm. So that's perfect. Okay. So I want to help you simplify how to think about the problems that you have in your accounting practice. So I already told you about me. There are some fun details. Mm -hmm. I have an engineering degree. That's my background. So um, I think what's salient about that for you is that I'm, we are all good in the numbers, the money and the math, especially the numbers and the math. Um, but I come at this from a problem solving standpoint, right? Like we, as engineers, we take big, unprobable, <laughs> hard to solve problems and try and get specific and try and solve them. Right. So um, that's why I think this problem of CPAs who work 80 hours a week is really fascinating because it's the sort of nebulous problem, but it has a ton of variables that if we just take them one at a time, we can address them. Mm -hmm. So this is the question, right? Why do accountants work weekends? And these are some of the answers that my clients have told me. Right? They're trying to catch up, trying to escape <laughs> from potentially from other things. Um, they've said they've probably said yes to too many things, not realizing that, you know, we think that we say yes to something is only going to be this big, but then it actually ends up being much bigger than we thought it was going to be. And we do that again and again and again. And then all of a sudden, um, there's way more work on our plates. And when we say yes to too many things, we're essentially asking, we're begging for gridlock in our businesses. And you also have this problem of sometimes staff being too green, right? So you hire somebody and you thought they were going to be getting up to snuff super fast, but that didn't quite happen as you had hoped. So they come at you with all kinds of questions that you think they should know the answers to. Uh, and th there's sometimes a problem of 
um, a lack of clear business boundaries, especially when working with your clients in terms of them getting you the documents and the answers that you need in time to get your job done, right? So you end up doing this thing that you all call chasing clients for documents. So there are all kinds of reasons, right? But those are those are some of the common ones. And I also want to offer you that part of the reason that accounts work weekends is not just because of what they think, but it's also what they don't think, right? Mm. There's an absence of certain kinds of thinking that needs to shift. And that's part of what we address here in these three problems. So here are your three problems. As a business owner, now your number one job is to create value for your clients. And I'll get into more specifically, what is that, right? Because value is esoteric and tangible nebulous. Your second job is to capture your value with effective pricing, right? That's how you get your money. I'll talk about that more in a second too. And then your third job is to deliver those results as efficiently as you can. Because your clients, they care about results. They, The only person, the only ones who care about how many hours you work are your partner or spouse and your golden retriever who wants to go out and play <laughs> fetch, right? Nobody else cares how much you work. There's it's no badge a, for it. I was just going to say, it's not the badge of honor that should be. we should be striving. No. Yes. The badge that you want is the 15 hour a week badge. Yes. I, I work 15 hours a week now. I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end uh, and for the same revenue. So we want to focus on delivering results efficiently. Okay, so problem number one, creating value for your clients. So here's the thing, here's the old way of thinking. And here comes my math background, right? Yeah. Revenue is a function of doing work for time, work over time for clients, right? This is a result of hourly billing. You, you can, we scapegoat hourly billing all day long around here that it has led, it has created this illusion that the way that you make money is by doing work and you do work, it takes time and you do it for clients. So you do work for the client, you send them the invoice, the client pays you money. So it looks like revenue comes from clients, but thinking that revenue comes from clients is like thinking that time comes from your watch, right? Mm -hmm. Revenue does not come from your clients. It comes because your clients saw value in what you were doing for them. The problem gets worse when the business owner, the CPA, thinks, okay, I want to grow my revenue. So if I want to grow my revenue, I've already tapped out all my hours. So the only way for me to get more hours now is to get more staff, right? So staff sub mm -hmm. N, you just keep adding staff and you multiply it by the work that you're doing over time for clients. So what's the problem here? Number one, this requires more clients. Number two, it requires more time. And number three, it requires more staff. And number four, it requires more work. And most of us don't want to work more. Most of us want, as business owners, want to work less. But this equation has us set up, has you set up to be working more and more and more and more and more. Yeah, it's kind of a simple one function, right? You've got one lever to pull. You have can one you lever to more, pull. Can you put, just put more in? And yeah, that, that leads to where we are today. Yeah. And... Because you only have one lever, you're not finding ways to leverage other options, other levers mm -hmm. to create leverage in your business. So your leverage is really limited. You're effectively buying hours low and selling them high, and that is your only leverage. Mm -hmm. Moreover, most of us as business owners, when I hear business owners complain, what's the number one thing they complain about? Staff. It's the most mm -hmm. common complaint. And yet the business model is designed around adding more staff, which is the thing that most of us complain the most about. I'm not saying that people are bad and staff are bad, but it is a challenging way to grow revenue. And it's not the only way to grow revenue. There's been a lot of talk about value pricing and so on. And many accountants have made the shift to flat rate pricing, tiered pricing. But that doesn't mean that their thinking has caught up to really getting their heads around value. And I hear this when I asked, 
when I ask the question, how much do you want to grow by next year or what's keeping you from growing your revenue? And mm -hmm. accountants will say, they'll say to me, we want to grow our revenue 40%, but we need to staff up. Right. So they have, even mm -hmm. if this is actually from a firm that has flat rate pricing, mm -hmm. they have flat rate pricing, but they still think that revenue requires staffing up. Revenue does not require mm -hmm. staffing up because revenue does not come from staff doing work over time. Revenue comes from value. Or they'll say, I would love to work less, but I can't afford to lose any revenue. Or I want to grow revenue by 40%, but I don't have more hours to give. It's so we can hear- relationship, right? That one lever is what they keep yep. reinforcing with that. Yeah. Yes. Yep. So you can hear it in the thinking when I ask what, if you, like, what's keeping you from growing your revenue? So often it's around, I need more staff. It's not. Mm -hmm. So we can hear that the shift, the thinking hasn't shifted, right? That revenue comes from value. So this is the problem that the fundamental revenue model, that the revenue model is fundamentally flawed. This is, revenue does not come from you or your staff doing work over time for clients. It's not where revenue comes from. Revenue is a function of the value that you create for your clients. It's always been that way. It's just that the accounting industry has been schooled in hourly billing. And so they've created this illusion that seemed normal and most people operated that way. So it looked like the normal way to do it, but the money always came from the value. And the reason if you ever have done the duck and cover billing, where you send an invoice to a client and then you hide under your desk, cause you know, they're going to fire back. <laughs> it's because you are concerned that the money they are paying is exceeding the value that, uh, the value to them. Right. And yeah. when the, the bill exceeds the value, that's when they fire back and they're upset. Right. So the revenue has always come from the value. And it's just that in the accounting space, they've been taught to price that way. So let's talk about this esoteric thing called value. What the heck is it? Right. We are numbers people. We like things that are specific, concrete. We like formulas. And we toss this thing out called value. And we're like, that's too intangible. I don't know what that is. What are you talking about? So I like to get concrete about value for you so that you can begin to wrap your head around it. Because like I said, the sooner you can get your head around value, what it is specifically and how to create it, the easier your business will get. And the easier your business gets, the less hours you have to work and the more money you can make. So that's the incentive for understanding this nebulous thing called value. So there are a lot of ways to create value. If we go from the bottom of the total pool up, we start at the bottom with commodities, then we go up to services, and then we have experiences, and then we have transformations. Hmm. So at the top of the totem pole is transformations. As a CPA, you are likely already creating transformations, but you haven't been given a framework for how to think about it. So what you're doing is pricing the service and selling the service. And I want to help you think about the transformations that you create for your clients and begin focusing on pricing that and talking about that and selling that. So what are the transformations? Let's just break it down. It's very likely that you create transformations when it comes to money, time, stress, and clarity. Four things. Hmm. There are probably more, but these are the most common ones. So you don't have to be sitting and meditating on a, on a mountainside to have a transformation. It doesn't have to be this grandiose thing. And the transformation is simply the difference between where the client was and where you get them to, where they are now and where they want to be. That's the transformation, the, the change that you affect over a period of time, whether it's every month, every quarter, every year, every week, whatever it is. So what are the transformations when it comes to money? You probably help them save on taxes in countless ways. You can probably help them reduce their expenses. You can probably help them make better decisions so that they make, so that they understand the impacts of the decisions that they're making before they make them. So they make smarter, wiser decisions in their businesses or with their real estate investment portfolio and help them bring in more top line revenue. So you can, with accounting and tax, you affect financial money transformations. Mm -hmm. Similarly with time, 
you can help your clients save time, especially if you, and potentially compared to your competitors, if you design your systems to be really friction-free, hassle-free, and have a great experience, you save them time. They no longer have to be keeping up with their books every week. You save them time if they're trying, like I was as a business owner, trying to forecast and understand what was happening mm -hmm. in various scenarios going forward with my money. I burned countless hours. I mean, probably 10 hours a week, every week, trying to do forecasting in a spreadsheet because QuickBooks Online wasn't a thing at the time. And or QuickBooks, but and the whole budget thing. Anyways, I burned, I probably burned 10 hours a week as a business owner trying to understand my money, right? And where it was going and where it was headed. So if you can save your business owners time by doing all the things that they do, wasting time related to touching their money, trying to understand their money, dealing with the paperwork, the invoicing, the billing, the this, the that, the paperwork that flies all over the place, and you can get that off their plate and save them a bunch of time. That's a huge and valuable transformation for them. Mm -hmm. As business owners, they have, just like you, they wear 17 hats. They've got a lot of stuff going on. Anything you can do to save them a good bunch of time is really valuable for them. Third bucket is stress or whatever negative emotion they're feeling. If you are working with business owners, they're probably overwhelmed, stressed, tired. Um, they might be confused about their money. They might lack confidence around making decisions, whatever negative emotion they might be experiencing. If you can have a meaningful impact on that, that is a really valuable transformation. Now, some of you might be saying, we are accountants. We only trade in numbers. We don't deal in feelings. That's why I got into accounting. <laughs> <laughs> and that may be so, but now you're a business owner and people buy feelings and then they backfill with logic. So to the extent, again, that you can get your head around feelings are a real thing, not, we don't have to get the boxes of tissues out. We don't have to be woo, but stress, overwhelm, pressure, um, confusion. These are real things that business owners deal with. They might not say them overtly, but if you listen to the undercurrent of what's being said, you can recognize this. And if you can affect change at this level, it's incredibly valuable. And the fourth one is clarity. So a lot of business owners are bewildered about money or they don't have the clarity they would like when it comes to money and anything in between, right? That's a spectrum. So if you can help improve, if you can help them understand and increase clarity around the decisions that they're making before they make the decision, if they can have better clarity about what's happening with the money in their business, that is enormously valuable. Okay, so here are four specific transformations that you can affect when you work with your clients by providing CFO services, accounting services. I can't stand CAS and CAS 2.0, but anyways, for the sake of, for common parlance, when you apply your services to these four problems, you can make a big difference. Okay, another bucket is improving the client experience, right? Mm -hmm. Making it less friction for them, right? And friction, you know what friction is when the moment you go to Amazon to buy something instead of going to the store, right? Because all mm -hmm. the steps that require you finding your keys, getting your coat, getting in your car, driving to the store, finding a parking place, getting out of your car, locking your car, walking to the store, wandering around to the store, finding a clerk to find the thing you're looking for, going through the checkout line, inserting your credit card, getting the receipts, stuffing it in your purse, driving home, all of that is friction. And Amazon was like, hey, we can make this easier. They took out all the friction. No wonder they're so successful, right? Hassle falls mm -hmm. into the same thing. Like all the tedious stuff. How many times have you been to the doctor and filled out your name and address for the thousandth time? <laughs> You're like, what? Like you guys have this on file. And Why do you make me example, fill it out again? Yeah. As you give the example of Amazon, we all compare to other companies that don't make it easy. So what would make us think people don't think when working with their accountants? So like, how can that can't be like, whoever makes it as hassle-free as possible. I'm sure yeah. people are looking at the way they work with us and say, we make it harder. Yeah, like all the forms, all the bank accounts, routing numbers, all that stuff that gets lost, then email ping pong. Hey, we need your bank account. And like, I gave it to you. Like, where'd it go? Yeah. I lost it in the email. Like all the things, all the things. Um, and a personal example, I go to idaho.gov to pay my quarterly taxes. Mm -hmm. I am almost in tears before I've even clicked on anything. I can't even, like I get stuck at the login page. Yes. Right. I'm trying to give you money and you're making this so difficult. <laughs> I, yes, I know. I know. Reset my password. Can't get it. What email address? All the things. Yeah. Hassle, hassle everywhere. 
So how can you remove the hassle and the friction for your clients? But we need to know only, only you can know what that is for your clients. So you need to talk to your clients to find out all the things that are pain in the rear end for them and see what you can do to mitigate it, make it easier for them and so on. So sacrifice is an interesting one. What's sacrifice? So what are your clients giving up by working with you? Some people really like control and they don't like other people touching their money. It feels incredibly vulnerable. They might also be giving up having their finger on the pulse, right? Suddenly they outsource it. You're now you're handling it and they don't have the same access to visibility into their money that they used to have. When I switched from taking care of my own financials to outsourcing it, I gave up being able to know my numbers on the third of the month because I would do my numbers on the third. And now I have to wait till the 21st to find out. That's a sacrifice. So this requires getting inside of your client's heads and finding out what they are giving up by working with you. And on the effort side, like how easy is it to go through your onboarding process, right? Is all that stuff automated? Or do you have to look, do you get emailed docx forms that you need to print, write down, scan, mm -hmm. <laughs> email, upload to some portal that you're like, what is this portal? I need to log in a new password for Lysio. What? Lysio? How do I pronounce this? And then all those things get uploaded. And then, you know, like how much effort is it for your clients or is it just super seamless? Have you automated things? And the user experience on their side is so easy, right? I'm not saying that you have to do all these things tomorrow. I'm simply suggesting that you can create value. One of the places that you can create value is by improving the experience for your clients. And it's way more valuable than the so much of the, when we're trained that the work that we do is what creates value, this, the value of creating a much better experience and transformations for your clients is way more valuable than just getting the work done, right? Getting the work done is the minimum bar. Jody, okay. we have a question from someone. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I, I will, I'll just read it exactly as it says. You said that people buy feelings. Is there a mm -hmm. study of the trade-off between better experience versus a higher price? Is there a study of the trade-off between, between better experience, experience and a higher and price? Higher price? Let's see. I'm going to, I don't fully understand what the question is getting at, but I'm going to take a guess here. Better experience and higher price. Like how much more will people pay for a better experience? I think so. That's how I interpret yeah. it. Okay. Today. So I, I'm going to give you, so, you know, the folks at planet money, they do stuff, they do studies on this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the study that I recall doesn't exactly address this question. But they did do a study on a typical um, hybrid car, like a Tucson or something, mm -hmm. uh, like uh -huh. a Hyundai, and a Prius. And the price signal that they got was that people were willing to pay $1,000 more simply for a Prius compared to the standard other car that also got 45 miles to the gallon, simply because they wanted to buy the Prius, because the Prius has a kind of status and cachet among mm -hmm. people who care about uh -huh. these things. So... That's not, I recognize that's not the exact answer, but what I want you to get from that is that that is a perfect example of somebody buying a feeling, right? You buy a Prius and it has status among people who care, who have, who care about Priuses, right? And they were willing to pay a thousand dollars more simply for the Prius compared to the other car that got the, got $45, 45 miles a gallon. Yeah. So I, go ahead. I think that's a really good example. What came to my mind is I thought of restaurants where high-end expensive restaurants, I think you'd argue the food is better. Mm -hmm. Is it worth maybe four or five times as much? And yeah. many people go saying, no, the experience that I get when I sit down and get this at the luxury, people are yeah. saying it's worth it. And are you willing to pay the higher price? It Mostly it's experience that you're getting. So along these lines, you could pay four bucks for a hamburger at McDonald's. And recently I was out with a friend and she sold me on, you have to come here because they have the best hamburger in the world. And okay. I was like, the oh, best hamburger in the world. I like my ears are perked up. <laughs> and the ham like I didn't even look at the price. I just got the ham. I didn't even look at the menu. Uh, <laughs> just yes. ordered the hamburger. And it was $29. <laughs> and I was fine with it. I was like, great, I'm willing to pay $29 to see if this is the best hamburger in the world. 
Mm-hmm. Right. So that's more than five times the price. It was yeah. a nice restaurant, white tablecloths, the whole bit. Sure. But I, right. So people are willing to pay a lot more money for something that they expect is going to be a lot better. That's going to be a better experience overall. And you know this, like you're saying, Tom, anytime you go to a nicer restaurant compared to McDonald's, where you can get a similar kind of food that fills your belly and solves the problem of hunger. Yeah. So, um, and I can, I'll see if as I'm talking, I can come up with clients of mine who have raised prices as they've increased value. Mm-hmm. Most of the folks I work with, we focus on transformation over experience because there's so much more, it's um, it's a much, it's lower hanging fruit to capture the value for in transformations than it is in experience. Because changing, improving the experience inside your accounting practice kind of requires that you go through with a fine tooth comb and update all your systems and processes, which might be, you know, a six to 12 month thing. Whereas shifting your mindset to think about the transformations that you are providing for your clients can be done in a day or a week. It's a much faster, it therefore lower hanging fruit. Good. Okay. Let's talk about um, the portion of the, let's talk about pricing really is what this is, right? So if the problem is that revenue is a function of the value that you create for your clients, now how you capture that value is with pricing, right? So I talk about this thing called the coefficient of pricing effectiveness. All coefficients are made up. I made up this coefficient. It's like, you know, the coefficient of friction. Anytime you push something across your desk, the friction between the two surfaces, there's a coefficient. It's from physics. It's arbitrary. It's just a ratio. So same thing. This is arbitrary. It's just a ratio. And here's how I explain it. And just through this example, you've probably had this experience if you're a CPA and you're in tax where a client comes in and they're like, hey, um, I just wanted to talk to you because I'm going to sell my house and I want to sell my boat and I want to sell my business and I'm thinking about selling my kids and I, um, I'm going to move across state lines. So let's talk about the tax implications. And you, and you run some numbers and you're like, well, okay, you could sell that. Don't sell the house. You haven't lived in it for two years. Uh, you'll pay capital gains or however that works. Your business, you know, you're looking at a 1.5 X multiple. Uh, so here's, you know, here's what you're going to get, blah, blah, blah. You run the calculations. Your kids are dependents. They haven't been behaving well. You're probably not going to get a high multiple on them. So you run all the calculation and it spits out, we can save you $30,000 if you do this. And it takes you like, you're so good at your job that this takes you all 20 minutes, right? So you save your client $20,000. It takes you 20 minutes and you're like, well, how do I price that? And you're like, well, I, you know, I bill at 150 an hour and it was only 20 minutes. So maybe if I round up, then it was 30 minutes. And so, okay, I'm going to send him a bill for 125 bucks, right? So you're pr- in this case, mm-hmm. of course, your fictional case, your price, your coefficient of pricing effectiveness is 0.4%. Right? So it's a terribly ineffective, inefficient way to price. Because you created $30,000 worth of value in terms of tax savings and you're pricing $125. This is why your client sends you champagne, right? And they're like, because they recognize the imbalance. They're like, my God, my CPA just saved me 30 grand in 20 minutes and they charged me 125 bucks for it. I feel bad. So they send you a bottle of champagne or a bouquet of roses. And they tell all so, their friends. Right? I asked this question about friends. moving and I saved myself net 20 some thousand dollars. Yes. Right. And now your client roster is flooded with people who think you work for super cheap. Yes. So I want to offer you to consider a, co- a nice coefficient of pricing effectiveness to be more in the 10% or 20% range. So now if you're creating $30,000 worth of value, the price in advance, not the bill, because that's different, the price in advance for consultations is more in the $3,000 range. Now, of course, this begs the question, how do I set up that service? Because I can't predict when somebody's going to call my phone, I'm going to be able to save them $30,000 or $100,000 or $5,000. So it requires that we change the nature of the engagement, the way in which you work with people. And this is why Ron Baker goes on and on about pricing the relationship, if you will, and having your people on subscription, because you never know when this phone call is going to come in, but you can guarantee that over the course of a year, or maybe you know every other year or something with a client, that they're going to have this kind of phone call. Okay. So in any case, rule of thumb, 15% of the value that you create for your clients, that's <laughs> but you're, of course, you're thinking, well, the financial value is one piece, but how do you price transformations and experiences? How do you put a price on that stuff? And the answer is that you can't, you just have to guess. 
And for numbers loving people like us, that's really hard. We feel way out of our comfort zone when we're just guessing at prices. We think it's wrong to just pull numbers out of thin air, but I can promise you that pulling numbers out of thin air is how you determine your prices. I run a mastermind. It's four months. The price is $7,500. Why? Because I know that I can generate 10 times the value of that, right? Like I just had one client who told me yesterday that in eight months of working together, her net profit's gone up $100,000. Right. So she did two rounds with me. It was $10,000. That's 10% of coefficient pricing, coefficient of pricing effectiveness. Are my prices arbitrary? Yes. People, do I know that I can create the value? Yes. Do I think it's a reasonable price to pay for creating $100,000 of net profit? Yes. So does she. We agree. We're happy working together. It's arbitrary. We have to get comfortable as numbers loving people with the arbitrariness of pricing. And we have to test prices to see how our marketplace responds. Okay. So let's talk about delivering results efficiently. So once we know what transformations your client really cares about, and this requires talking to them and listening at a deeper level, right? Not just talking shop and delivery and all the, the work that you need to do in order to make it done, but to really understand why your client is coming to you in the first place. Why are they not going to somebody else? Let me, let me slow down. If you want to understand why your clients are coming to you in the first place, you can ask three questions. They're called the why questions. And simply put, they are why me, why now, why in this manner? So why work with me? Why not work with any of the CPAs in a four block radius, right? There are 50 of us in this town. Why'd you pick me? And they're going to tell you something. So that's what you want to listen to. They're going to say, you came highly regarded. You specialize in this industry. You focus on e-commerce. I want someone who really gets e-commerce because I want to grow my business. I want to make more money. I want to drive up my profits. My profit margins are abysmal and I'm really stressing out and it's causing tension at home, blah, blah, blah. Right? They're going to tell you why they came to you. Why now is, you know, why not wait six months? Why didn't you do this six months ago? They're going to tell you why it's important now. And why in this manner is, you know, why not just go on, why not just have, I don't know, FreshBooks do it, right? Why not just have your spouse do it? Oh, that creates all kinds of problems. <laughs> They'll tell you why in this manner. So those are the questions you can ask to get on, to elicit, to surface what is important to them in their eyes about working with you. So listen closely to their answers because that will reveal to you what they value in their perception. And their perception is their reality, right? So you don't get to question them on this. I mean, you don't get, you don't get to, uh, it's real to them and that's what matters. So once you know what transformations they are looking for in working with you, and once you know what transformations they're looking for in working with you, then you ask yourself, okay, how do I deliver? How do I do my work? so that I can deliver that transformation reliably, predictably, and as quickly as possible. Because your client is all about results. They want problems solved. So now it is your job, back to the beginning, being a business owner, being CEO, now it is your job to think about how do I deliver that result as quickly, as reliably, as fast as possible with the least effort from me and from my team. So the reason that I put these three problems together is to help you think differently about your accounting practice. And if you go into CFO services or advisory services to help you rethink how you set up your business so that you are no longer running <laughs> scattered, hair on fire all over the place in a million directions for a million different kinds of clients. And instead you train your sites on what is the transformation that my clients are looking for and how do we deliver that reliably and as fast as possible. So your job now is to go through your systems. Let me back up and scour each of your systems to find out how you can do it faster. And I wanna offer you that you don't have an infinite number of systems in your business. Mm -hmm. If you have an infinite number of systems in your business, you are toast. That is a problem. <laughs> you have a finite number of systems in your business. They are probably around the delivery, onboarding, delivery. You have, I have a list in a minute. It's a finite number. Right? So your job now is to go through each of your systems one by one by one, find the ones where you think you can get the most bang for your buck, 
you get the most time back for the least amount of effort, right? Don't start with the hardest one. Start with the highest mm -hmm. value one. Go through and ask yourself how you can do this faster. And if you have staff, get your staff on board. How can you do all of this faster, right? Because your number one concern at the top was time. So the way to get your time back is to hold everything steady, right? Just keep that constant and back to solving like algebra, hold everything else constant and focus on your systems. You've got them here. You have a longer list than just this, but this is just to get you started. Start making these things more efficient. You are not paid for your time. You are paid for the value you create. And you win and your clients win when you get faster at your job and when you price up front, your clients don't care how long it takes. In fact, they want it done as fast as possible. And the faster they can get the results, the, fa the more value you create for them. Geraldine, when you have people go through and do this, to what extent are they looking at efficiency from the client perspective? Are they looking at like, you know, when we collect documents for your taxes, how much are you saying is this, how much time am I maybe saving for my clients versus how much do I get to save for my own staff? Is that a big part so, of the equation? Well, so there, those are in two different locations, right? So how much time do I save for my staff is in the defi uh, efficient delivery bucket. Right. How much time do I save for my client is in the transformation bucket or in the better okay. experience bucket. Okay. That makes sense. Right. So I think you want to do both, right? Mm -hmm. But recognize that they're for different purposes. Okay. Yeah, that's very helpful. And, and if you're suff if for listeners who cited at the top that they were time was their biggest problem, then so I may coach for CPAs, but I'm not your coach. So consult a coach before you make these decisions, right? Mm -hmm. But hold everything else constant. Don't say yes to any new work and focus on scouring and getting your systems dialed in so that you are not using your brain to remember things and you're not using your brain to remember how to do things. We want your brain, your brain is of all the assets that you have, right? On your balance sheet, your brain is the most valuable one. It's not on your balance sheet, but I can promise you that there's nothing more valuable than how you think and what you think about. Because that is what drives revenue in your business. That's what drives value. And that's what drives revenue in your business. And if you can use your brain to take a step back, instead of ta taxing it and tasking it with remembering how to do all these things and, and what you have to do and holding all this information in your head, your brain is a terrible, it does a terrible job of that. Tom, we were talking about this um, in the green room that we're fans of David Allen and getting things done, that your uh -huh. brain is not good. Like don't make it remember things. Right. Dial in your systems so that all that stuff happens easily and without you thinking so that you free up your brain for more creative, higher value work. I know I said the word creative. I don't mean artistic. I just mean focusing on solving problems and solving problems requires us to be creative in how we solve our problems. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we go through your business scour each one scour your the first thing is to just tabulate um write down all what all your systems are right you need to know what they are before you can do this process write down what all your systems are for everything as much as you can and then just go through each one scour them optimize them right so when i talk about thinking differently when I talk about scouring and optimizing, so just for example, one thing that I find with clients in my program is one of the things that they do is free discovery calls, right? So somebody calls them up, they want to kick the tires, they burn 20 or 30 minutes, they give a ton, of, they give away a ton of value. And that person's like, oh my gosh, great, thanks. And they hang up the phone and you never hear from them again. And you're thinking, God, mm -hmm. I gave that guy so much value and he never called me back. And, and the guy's thinking, that was great. I can't believe that guy gave me so much value. I don't need to call him back. So... We don't, we, we don't ask the question, how do we make discovery calls more efficient? We dispense with free discovery calls altogether and we go to paid, paid strategy sessions that are, there's a button on your website. It goes right to Calendly or Acuity. Person schedules time, goes right to a payment system. It's in my case, for most of my clients connected up through QuickBooks. They pay $4.95 for an hour, goes on the CPA's calendar has an automated workflow with questions. What do you want to talk about? What's most important to you to get out of our time? Blah, blah, blah. It's all automated. They get paid. My C my client gets paid $4.95, 495 not $4.95 <laughs> for an hour of their time. And it was all automated, right? 
So this is what I'm talking about when I say scour each system and optimize it. And don't think about how to optimize the existing system. Ask yourself if you can do it a whole better way, right? So for example, clients chasing clients for documents. What is happening that you are chasing clients for documents? What, how does the system need to be altered at the top end so that clients don't get chased for documents? Because I can't imagine a worse use of time than chasing a client for a document, mm -hmm. right? Pick up, put down, email, phone tag, blah, blah. Similarly, answering the phones. My question is, you guys have phones, <laughs> right? Do you need to have phones? Can all conversations, not, I'm not necessarily talking inside your office, but just ask yourself because you probably have a fair amount of, you may have clients who are analog, right? They're old school. Ask yourself if all of that can be automated and you no longer have phones, everything is virtual. I have clients sometimes who, when they start working with me, they still drive to visit clients. I'm like, wait, what? Hold on. We're not going to make that system more efficient. We're going to get rid of that system. Everything's going to be virtual. Similarly with interruptions. Clients are like, how do I stop interruptions? I'm like, wait a minute, who's interrupting you? What's happening in the system? So, so often these are downstream symptoms where we need to go way upstream to ask why this is happening in the first place. Right? How do we address interruptions way upstream so that interruptions no longer happen? I don't get interrupted. Nobody interrupts me. I don't allow it. I don't allow interruptions because the system is designed such that there are no interruptions. And when people need me for things, I have a system for giving people what they need. But on my timeline, right? And I lay out what I clear about the expectations so that they're fine with it, right? And similarly for paper, if you still have paper, um, and you have clients who are analog and send you paper statements and all the rest, look at that system and ask yourself, how do we totally change the system so that we're no longer touching paper? And similarly, if you have clients in email, email is, I can't imagine, I, the only thing that I think is less efficient than email is going to Facebook for business and tax advice. Like, how do I handle, I have this client with this regular random situation. How would you guys handle this tax thing? When I see CPAs going to Facebook, for how to do their jobs. I'm like, holy smokes, I can't imagine a more inefficient way because you're gonna go in there, you're gonna get lost for 45 minutes. Not to mention, you've gotta come back and sift through 17 comments and figure out which answer is best. Like, I'm like, whoa, okay. So anyways, Facebook I think is worse, but email is almost as bad. So get your clients out of email. It's a terrible, it's a, it's an, in a, 30 years ago when it came around, 1995 or whatever, mm -hmm. it was great. But 30 years later, we've gotta find a better, there are more efficient ways. Yeah. Okay. Lastly here, how you think about your time. So your time is not something that you find or manage or make, right? The only thing that happens is time ticks by day after day. And all that you get to do is <laughs> ask yourself, what am I doing and when am I doing it? And that is it. You can't make time. You're not going to find it. It's not under the couch cushions. So your job is to ask your brain, what are the best decisions I can make about my time? rather than go on this sort of goose chase of, I can't find time for audit. And there's never enough time to respond to my clients. You're not gonna find it. You've gotta, the thing is to change your systems so that you have enough time and to get your client roster underneath your capacity so that you have margin and padding and white space in your calendar. Because if you're not, you're just begging for gridlock. It's like a traffic jam out there and you can't move when you have way too many clients. So these are your three problems, hopefully simplified so that you know where to prioritize your time as a business owner, as somebody whose job it is to work at three levels. You're working at the delivery level as the person who delivers the fractional CFO services or the advisory services, you are delivering the work, but you're also managing yourself, the person who delivers the work and you're the CEO of the manager, right? So you need to think at all three levels. And I wanted this to be more simple. Like as the CEO, what do I need to think about? As the CEO, what you need to think about is creating value for your clients, pricing effectively and delivering efficiently. So when you create value for your clients, that's what generates the potential revenue. You capture it with effective pricing. So that's the money side. And then the time side is efficient delivery and get out of the thinking that it's, you have to work because work is required to make money because it's not. I work 15 hours a week and I make multiple six figures, right? 15 hours a week and my stress levels are way down. And the less I work, the more my margins go up. So I want you to have the same experience of getting out of this old paradigm of working all the time for money. Yeah. 
in so there you go create key. value sorry price effectively that. deliver create value price effectively deliver efficiently that's all you got to yeah. do Okay, sorry to interrupt. We do have one yeah. last question from Brian that said, I'm a little confused. Alternative, what is the alternative to email? And I've got a thought, but would love your. Sure. Yeah. So Teams, Slack, um, portals, Teams, Slack, and portals for starters. Yeah. Yeah. I, I what agree. Do you... uh, all of our clients we have on Slack and say that is the best way to interact directly with us. For many of them, it's the first time that they are using Slack themselves and often they like yep. that. The others, you mentioned portals, when it comes to document exchange, setting up mm -hmm. something to say, here's where you put it and it goes to the right place. And mm -hmm. we will say, do not drop things in email to us. That's the best chance for getting things lost. Um, for that. That's also where we like solutions like bill.com for invoice receipt, things like that as a, yeah. a place to say, get, get away from email being the place where important information is exchanged. <laughs> important information goes to get lost. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Very good point. Uh, this is excellent. Some really good questions and ways that we can help think through this. So thank you. Thanks, Geraldine, for yes, doing that. You are welcome. More than happy to. I have a couple slides to close us out then. Um, so next one, we hope that people enjoyed this. If you want to keep learning, we I help facilitate a modern CPA success show. Um, we have lots of guests on. Um, you can actually search in YouTube for Modern CK Success Show and Geraldine Carter, and you'll see a, hear a conversation where we talked about, I think it was called Niche Down and Price Up was the one that we had. So you, you can get more of this kind of content in there. If you jump to the next slide, you'll see if you want to be more interactive with us, we have a CFO community. And so you can try this out for one month, but get on and you have other CPAs interacting on here and asking questions and exchanging information. You can see in the list kind of some of the topics that are in there. So I'd encourage people to interact with us. I had mentioned that I do the virtual CFO role. We have a playbook that teaches people how to do everything that we do within Summit Virtual CFO by Anders. So if you're interested, this is a pretty intensive course, 24 CPE credits, but we'll take you through everything that we do, including our specific pricing module, discounts on tools. You can get a coaching session and we do a weekly meeting where people will interact and say, Here's, here are the problems I'm running into. Can you show me this again? And I facilitate those sessions. So I'd really encourage people for that. And finally, you might be thinking, oh, that sounds great, but can I just join you guys? And we are hiring. So this is a plug that if this sounds appealing to you, you can see how you can check out our career opportunities. Geraldine, thank you very much. This was really helpful. I think uh, the questions that we got, people got a lot of value out of this and great way for people to start off their year. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we wish you a year with more revenue and fewer hours at your desk. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Everyone take care. Hope everyone has a fantastic day. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.